Okay, well, welcome. I'm glad you were all able to join us here tonight. And this is a Tuesday night, so uh, welcome to the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Uh, my name is Marjan Farid, and uh, I'm the director of the cornea and cataract service here at, at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. And so uh, with that comes a lot of um, dry eye and ocular surface disease. And we see a lot of that in Southern California. So I've named the topic of this talk, sort of dry eye a Southern California epidemic because it feels like every patient I see, including myself, has some degree of dry eye disease. Um, so this is a, it's a topic that's close to my heart because I suffer from it as well, but a lot of my patients do as well. And it, it impacts surgical outcomes, it impacts satisfaction post-cataract surgery, it affects so many different parts of our lives. So um, hopefully we can shed a little bit of light on um, what causes dry eye disease, although it's so multifactorial, it's hard to name one thing, but more importantly, how do we treat it and manage it? Sorry, there's a lot of feedback here. So. I apologize for that. Um, and I like to keep this talk very interactive, so please feel free to interrupt me if you have a burning question about what's going on and we can delve into things further. We don't have to wait till the end. Okay, so with that, um, let's talk a little bit about causes or better yet risk factors of dry eye disease um, and there's a few here but there's a lot more than this these are some risk factors we think that things like screen time and increased device time has really contributed to um, this bigger epidemic of of ocular surface dryness that we're seeing um, when we are at a screen our blink rate goes from about 20 blinks per minute to about four. And the blink is such an important physiological part of a healthy tear film on the ocular surface. So we think that increased screen time over the past few decades has really contributed um, to why we're seeing a lot more dry eye disease. Uh, systemic medications play a big role. Antihistamines, um, antihypertensive medications, um, you know, there's a multiple uh, you know, uh, list of systemic medications that we all take in one form or another that dry out our bodies and, and specifically our tear film and ocular surface. Um, alcohol and smoking we know is bad for everything, including dry eye disease. Arid conditions, so dry conditions really also impact dry eye disease. A humidifier in the room, I tell patients, can be very helpful um, because it increases the moisture. I've heard a lot of patients say, well, will they go on vacation to Florida or to a humid uh, environment? Their dry eyes are fantastic, they get better. So humid humidity helps, um, and opposite, dry, uh, dry air makes things worse. Uh, windy environments, so we're in a lot of wind these days, so windy environments definitely contribute. And that includes air conditioners, that includes ceiling fans, um, that includes um, flights. I have patients who are, go on long flights and their dry eyes get a lot worse when they're in a plane. And that's from that constant sort of air circulation that's going on. So we'll keep going. And then pollutants are definitely a risk factor too. So if you're living in a more polluted um, environment, fortunately our air quality is fairly good here, but um, that can also impact dry eye disease. So these are among some of the risk factors that influence why we have dry eye disease, but they're among a lot of others. So triggers of dry eye disease can either be irritated, so things that irritate the ocular surface, things that create inflammation to the ocular surface, or tear film instability from changes in the balance of oil to water in the tear film. So the tears have sort of a water layer, a mucus layer, and an oil layer. And the oil layer is really what protects that tear film on the ocular surface. So oil layer contributes to, um, uh, or, or lack of good oils contributes to early evaporation. So irritants can include environment, medications, contact lenses, or surgery. LASIK surgery is pretty notorious for making dry eyes worse. Um, but even things like cataract surgery, even though they don't directly cut through the nerves of the cornea, 
cataract surgery or any ocular surgery can create some uh, worsening in the dry eye symptoms for a period of time. So for my cataract patients, I say, let's optimize your tear film as much as possible before we take you into surgery to really uh, you know, improve the tear film because I know once I put patients through cataract surgery, putting them on the preserved drops after cataract surgery, having their eye open for a period of time, all of those things contribute to a temporary worsening of the dry eyes. Inflammation, so patients that have chronic allergies or inflammatory autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, um, even diabetes, all of those are inflammatory autoimmune diseases that can create inflammation in the lacrimal duct that creates the tears. And um, a big player is also uh, perimenopausal, so hormone receptors on the lacrimal gland and the ocular tissue um, you know, that, are, that are sensitive to a balance between the estrogen and progesterone and the testosterone. Um, impact dry eye disease. So, so which is it? We know testosterone is a little bit protective. So as we lose our, t and that's why women tend to have dry eye disease a little bit more than men, but men also get dry eye disease. And often a low testosterone level in men can be one of the main culprits um, as to why they suddenly develop more dry eye disease. Yes? Do you notice any relationship to uh people who have pets? So pets, if they create allergies, um, allergy in general is an inflammatory process. It can go hand in hand with worsening the dry eyes. So if the pet is creating allergies, then they, they, they can get dry eyes. Absolutely. But a big group then is women who are sort of undergoing hormonal changes and men who are undergoing hormonal changes. So we talked a little bit about this increasing age, women, underlying hibonia gland disease. That is a disease of the oil glands of the eyelids that produce the oils that go into the tear film. Medications, we talked about this, history of surgery, history of contact lens wear, and then autoimmune diseases. So, um, so when, when I see a dry eye patient, how do I, what do I do? So the first thing in my mind is I try to assess severity level. And we assess that based on two big things. One is symptoms, what the patient is telling me they're experiencing, and it's so variable in dry eye disease. Some patients say they have pain, some patients don't have pain at all and say, well, I can't have dry eye disease, I don't have any discomfort but they do, they might have fluctuating vision instead because of the oil layer and the imbalance in the tear film. Um, some people get tearing. They get reflex tearing and say, I can't have dry eye disease, I have tearing. But it's because the underlying good healthy tears are low and the body's getting this reflex message to the brain to over tear and you get these watery tears that are a response to the underlying dry eyes or dry eye disease. So. Um, uh, burning, discomfort, pain, um, tearing, fluctuating vision, all of these are varying symptoms of dry eye disease. Ocular fatigue, my, my eyes get tired at the end of the day and I just have to put my hand on my, those are all dry eye disease. Nothing else causes pain like that than dry eye disease. So symptoms of dry eye disease is my first sort of, I try to assess that. And, and actually the severest dry eye patients have no pain at all because the dry eye disease has actually um, killed the nerves in the cornea and so the pain sensation goes down, kind of like a diabetic foot ulcer um, where you can't feel it anymore. Some patients can't feel their cornea anymore and that can happen from a bunch of different things but severe, severe dry eye disease is one of them. So some patients have no, no symptoms at all. And then the second thing I look for are signs of dry eyes. So, okay. I now have heard what the patient tells me, now what do I see on the exam? And how do I assess that? So I'm looking at, um, sometimes we'll put a little stain in the tear film to see if there's these micro erosions on the cornea and the conjunctiva. Um, and you can see that here, this is a green stain at the bottom. So maybe, maybe the ocular surface stains a little, maybe it stains a lot. The ones that stain significantly, there's, there's more disease there. So that correlates with uh, a severity. Uh, tear breakup time. How long between blinks does a good tear stay on the ocular surface before it breaks up? It should, normal is more than 10. So if I put uh, a little stain and I look between blinks to see how that, that 
tear film looks between blinks, if it breaks up within a few seconds, that's pretty severe tear film imbalance. So we look at all this. So based on those two, then I categorize patients into a sort of mild, moderate, moderate, severe, and, and severe. And we talked about some of the symptoms. But fluctuating vision, some patients come to me because they think they have a cataract, or maybe it's the cataract that's causing the vision. They say, well, I, I start out reading just fine, and then I can't read anymore. Everything gets blurry after a few minutes. That's not cataract. Cataract doesn't do that. Cataract is blurry from the start. That's, that's tear film instability, or tear film is okay, and then you start reading, and then and the tear film gets irregular and breaks up, and, and that's where the blurriness comes from. So types of dry eye disease, I mentioned there's a mucus layer, water layer, and an oil layer. Um, so the water layer is called the aqueous, and so you can have a pure aqueous deficient dry eye disease. That's pretty rare to have a pure aqueous deficient. Sometimes patients of um, rheumatoid arthritis may have aqueous deficiency. The most common one is evaporative. Evaporative is the, is the type of dry eye disease where the oil layer is insufficient, and so the tear evaporates quickly. Um, and the most, actually the most common is a mixed variation of the two. So most patients will have a little bit of both with evaporative being present in about 85% of dry eye disease. We talked about tear breakup time. Again, that's, we want to see that tear stay for about 10 seconds or more on the ocular surface before it evaporates. Where are the oils made? The, oil ma the oils are made in the lid margins, in the meibomian glands. And, and you can see here, these are not normal glands. So normal glands should, when pressed, secrete a olive oil consistent clear oil into the tear film, a little aliquot. And it happens every time we blink, we release a little bit of that oil layer into the tear film. So patients that actually don't blink well or do a half blink, have you ever seen that? Where some patients don't do a full blink. They don't get good oil, because you need that upper lid to come squeeze the lower lid and, and spread that oil and spread it over the tear film. So if your blink doesn't go all the way, and some patients don't, they did physiologically the lid, so you have to kind of force it, oh yeah, I have to blink. I actually have to have my upper lid touch my lower lid to get that release of normal oils. So when you don't, and those oils start to sort of develop stasis, they get thickened, they become more um, initially milky consistency and then eventually into a toothpaste-like consistency. And uh, eventually the gland can atrophy and we actually see loss. Um, and it, this is not just an in aging patients. This is across the board. We're actually seeing in children now who are on the screen time for a long time that they're, they're atrophying their meibomian glands. We're seeing that it's been published. And I'll show you how we look at that now. But this is lid margin disease. There's a lot of inflammation. You see that from the redness. Some patients have what we call ocular rosacea, where you get the oil glands in the skin as well as the oil glands in the lids that are inflamed. Um, that's the redness, and sometimes you don't get the redness, but you get that thickening and toothpaste-like secretions of the, of the glands. So this is severe lid margin disease. And here, we can start this video. This is a patient where we've actually heated up the oil glands. We've applied heat, and now we're gonna squeeze out and see what comes out of those oil glands. <coughs> if this plays, this is a really cool video. <laughs> All right, so we're pressing on those oil glands. And, oh, actually, this is not even the super. You saw one pop over there? Actually, I have a much better video I'm going to show you guys at the end because it's amazing. But, um, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and show you that. Actually, if you give me one moment, I'm going to pull that up for you right now because this is. All right, so this is same thing. Patient's island margin has been heated. And we're gonna actually squeeze with, with these uh, kind of thick. <laughs> right, and there's some more. So this is not normal. This is not what your oils should look like. And uh, so th this is what we need to address. And when I describe this to patients, sometimes it's hard to describe it, but that's. It's okay, we've seen it. Yeah, I'm trying to come out of it now. <laughs> exactly. 
that's, that's majorly backed up thickened secretions. That's actually still um, treatable when it's like that. It's when, when nothing comes out anymore. That's really the irreversible, or we think it's irreversible. At this point, there isn't any really good way to get back glands that have totally atrophied. Those glands can still be helped. We can still you know, open up those obstructions. So evaporative dry eye is the most common cause. We talked about that. Um, we talked about staining of the ocular surface to look for little areas of microerosion. So if the tear film is chronically out of balance, the epithelium or the surface cells of the ocular surface, the cornea and the conjunctiva start to uh, disintegrate. And so you, we call these dry spots. They're not dry spots. It's not like you put a drop of something on them and they go away. They actually need to heal. So they, but the epithelium heals quickly. So if we get the right therapies on for patients, they can heal within you know, a few days to a few weeks. So these are some of the other testing we can do. We can look at osmolarity where we take a little bit of the tear, uh, uh, aliquot of the tear, uh, uh, and, and look at how salty it is. So that's a, if it's hyperosmolar, then we know that there's dry eye disease by definition, hyperosmolarity of the tear film. It's actually one of the central definitions um, that has been recently uh, published. Um, matrix metalloproteinase 9, MMP9, this is another test. If you're my patient, sometimes we, we, we do this a lot. We, we, again, a small aliquot of the tear is taken. It's almost like a little pregnancy test that tells us yes or no, is there MMP9 in the tear film or not? What is MMP9? It's an inflammatory cytokine. So again, if the dry eye has been chronic, it's been there for a while, the tear film is actually inflamed. So there's inflammatory markers in the tear film, and uh, that clues me in that I need to start an anti-inflammatory drop on this patient. Hey, sorry, Go ahead. So we're see, I'm going to talk about treatments in a minute. So that's an anti-inflammatory. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. So meibomian gland imaging is the other thing that has become very useful in, in terms of assessing how healthy those oil glands are. Normal is that, where you see these nice, long oil glands, um, skinny ones. Um, with disease, they shorten, they fatten, um, and then they actually drop off. Again, there's areas where there's missing uh, meibomian glands, and, and so that's how we know there's disease based on the severity of the glands. So treatments, let's go into treatments now. We talked a little bit about how, what are the risk factors, how do we diagnose dry eye disease in the clinic, and now we have our patient, we've, we've sort of assessed all of that. Now how do I individualize my dry eye treatment? Not any two dry eye patients are the same. Every single dry eye uh, patient I have is different and will respond differently and it's based on the constellation of their risk factors and their signs and symptoms. So there's no quick fix. And I usually tell patients, let's find you know, the cocktail that works for you to manage the dry eyes, to manage the symptoms, um, to kind of optimize the tear film as much as we can. And, and usually they're long-term treatments. Now I may start very aggressive and then once patients are better back down to a minimal therapy and just and keep going, but a lot of patients will feel better and then they'll stop using their therapy and then they get worse again, including myself. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a terrible patient. Um, but sometimes it requires multiple interventions, again, depending on severity. By the time patients come and see me, usually, um, most of my patients are in the moderate to severe category. I, I don't even see mild dry eye patients. They are usually treated on their own or by optometrist or by their primary care. So artificial tears, we've seen all of the you know, different brands over the counter. There's preserved, there's non-preserved. Patients always ask me, well, which one is the better one? There aren't really any good head-to-head -head studies on these drugs, and each company will say theirs is the best. There's some pros and cons. There's ones that have oil-based um, that I like for patients who are oil deficient, um, but I always ask patients to use preservative-free um, artificial tears, if at all possible. So they're usually the ones that come in the little vials and you break them off. Um, if you're using artificial tears more than four times a day, you should be using preservative-free, because anything more than that, then you're getting too much preservative on the eye. 
Um, there's nighttime gels and ointments. Some patients sleep with their eyelids open a little bit, especially for those patients. I say lubricate during the night with something like a gel or an ointment to um, protect the ocular surface when you're sleeping. Um, so these are sort of baseline, first line therapies. Again, by the time I see patients, we're sort of past this point. Um, not that those aren't good and we need to continue those, but we usually need to go on to the next level. So somebody asked me about Restasis. Restasis, um, you may have heard of, now there's also Sequa. Um, these are topical anti-inflammatories. It's cyclosporin-based, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory medication. You use it on the eye twice a day. It's an eye drop. Some patients bring in me their Restasis and say, this is my artificial tear. It's not an artificial tear. It's not a lubricant. What it does for patients who have um, inflammation in their tear film, it actually uh, turns off those activated, what we call T cells, the immunological T cells that are um, creating that inflammation. It turns them off, or it prevents new ones from turning on. And uh, both of these drops are good. Restasis has been around for almost 15 years now, 13 to 15 years. Um, and now Sequa, which is also cyclosporin with a little bit of a different, higher percentage, and it's sort of the delivery, uh, the molecular delivery of it is a little different to the ocular surface. Um, both of these take several weeks to work. So I always tell patients when we start one of these, give it a few weeks, like six weeks, before you say yes or no. All of these topical anti-inflammatories can have side effects like burning. But that's, a, you know, that's about it, or, or you taste them after you instill them into the eye. But none of them are dangerous. None of them are dangerous. And, and the other one that's um, approved a couple of years ago, and it's a nice one as well, is Lefitograst or Zydra. Some of you may be on it. Um, this one is a little bit faster acting because it not only prevents new T cells from activating, but it also shuts down already active T cells. That's why they think the mechanism of action is a little bit faster. But it's also twice a day, morning and night. Um, and so I have patients that have tried both Restasis and Zydra, and some prefer Zydra, some prefer Restasis, some say Zydra stings, some say Restasis stings. It's variable. They work through a similar mechanism. Zydra may have a little bit of a faster and more thorough onset of action. But you know, if patients are doing well on Restasis, I keep them on Restasis. And then Sequa is the newer one that just got released. And that's, so far, we've had good, um, good response from that as well. So those are some topical anti-inflammatories. The best topical anti-inflammatory and the worst is our steroids. They're fantastic. They work immediately. They cool down the surface. They cool down inflammation. But they're steroids. They're not a good long-term solution um, because they can have side effects like increasing the pressure, intraocular pressure in the eye and such. So steroids I'll reach for um, as a rescue. So for patients who are having periodic flare-ups, so maybe you're on restasis and doing well, but maybe two or three times a year, you may be getting a severe flare-up of the dry eyes. That's where we can use a mild, low-potency steroid for maybe a week, just to sort of, as a rescue, to throw it on, get you back to your baseline, and then you're good to go again for a while. So steroids are good and bad. And there's a few that are in front of, there's one specifically that's in front of the FDA right now, which is showing a very good safety profile um, for the indication of episodic dry eye disease. So um, that's sort of in a pipeline therapy that's around the corner. Some patients um, who have a lot of that rosacea, do you remember I showed that picture of the really hot inflamed red eyelids? Um, sometimes for those patients, we'll also add an oral um, anti-inflammatory antibiotic medication. Dermatologists use it. Um, they're oral tetracyclines, such as doxycycline or minocycline. Um, these are good for the inflammation around the oil glands. So sometimes I'll use that. Uh, punctal occlusion, have you, you guys know about punctal plugs? Some people have had those. For years, that's all we had for dry eye disease. So we were plugging everybody. Even if their tear film was inflamed, we plug them. But we realized when we plug patients who, who have inflamed tear films, their symptoms actually got worse. Because now you were retaining all of this inflamed, hot, acidic tears on the ocular surface. So punctal plugs are still a good therapy, but we've sort of moved them down in, in the 
in the algorithm of how we do things. I like to create an anti-inflammatory healthy tear base first. And then if we just need more volume of tears, then we'll put, we'll put a punctal plug, which plugs the drainage and slows down the drainage of the tears. But they don't stay in before. Yeah, sometimes they don't stay in. There's different types of punctal plugs. There's silicone, there's collagen, there's dissolvable ones. So, you know, in the extreme case where um, some patients can't hold on to their plugs. Sometimes I'll send them to my oculoplastics colleague and have them just suture them closed. But that's really for rare cases. Usually we can put plugs in that are dissolvable. They have dissolvable ones now that last six months that just tuck in and, and can't fall out. So there's, there's things that are better. Uh, so the neurostimulation is also being looked at as a pathway, and there's a couple of new um, innovations in this area. So we have a nerve, the nasociliary nerve, that sort of comes into our nose. If you excite that nasociliary nerve, there's a trigger that's sent back to the ganglion and to the brain, and, and it activates a tear to form. And this tear has the mucus layer, the water layer, and the oil layer. It's not a reflex tear. So um, there's a couple of products that are kind of cool that came from sort of the discovering of this pathway. One of them is called True Tear, made by Allergan, sort of mixed uptake. It's basically a little device. I actually, on my last lecture, I demonstrated it. I decided never to do that again. <laughs> but basically, you plug, you, 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 it has two little prongs, and you put it on this little device. That, that, that's that little blue device you see here and you put this little device head to it and you put it into your nose and you actually give yourself a little electric shock it's a small one it's small <laughs> it sounds terrible yeah. it's it's a very small electric shock to the tip of that nasociliary nerve that then creates a tear and some patients love that they say it's the natural way and this and that but anyways so that um the uptake has been Mediocre. There's another company that's looking at a nasal spray. Nasal sprays we're a little bit more comfortable with because some patients use nasal sprays for allergies. That nasal spray does the same thing. It excites that nerve and creates a true tear. The thought is that after using it maybe four to six to ten times a day that you actually start getting a healthier ocular surface and you don't need it as much. So, Do you do this one yourself? Yeah. You have to do it. No, no, you do it. So it's expensive. You have to buy that little device, and the tips are disposable, and it's like nine hundred dollars for the device, and then a a thirty day pack is something like I don't know thirty dollars or something like that. I think uh, actually I think we have it here, but again I only have a handful of patients that have decided to use it. I think it's reasonable. There, as long as it doesn't hurt, I'm always willing to try things. You know, And the handful of patients that I have that like it, love it. So it depends. It depends if it's something you think you're going to do. So Can you say the spray is available? The spray is not yet available. That's a pipeline. It will be. And I think, I think that might be easier for patients to do than the electric shock. <laughs> okay, what about lid margin treatment? So remember, the lid margin is like 85% of the culprit is lid margin disease. So what I tell every single patient, if you're my patients, you know, because I say this all the time, hot, it says warm compresses, but it's really hot compresses, hot compresses. You need that sustained heat um, for a good five to 10 minutes, and it's gotta be pretty hot to melt those oils and get them flowing. So uh, I tell patients, think of hot compresses uh, like brushing your teeth. Try to do it every day. Mm -hmm. If you can't do it every day, do it a few times a week. But that, that sort of helps keep the oil glands flowing. There's really nice masks that you can get, and you microwave them for 20 seconds, put that on the eye, and, and um, they, sustain, they hold the sustained heat. Try not to explode them in the microwave. I've had patients that left in it too long, and then they explode. Um, now, when we do a hot compress, they're nice, but they do, that heat has to travel through a skin layer, a muscle layer, and a mucus layer before it actually gets to the oil glands. So there's things we can do to get the heat more precisely over those oil glands, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute. Um, there are, for patients who have a lot of gunk that builds up around their lashes, what we call blepharitis, that can contribute to the oil glands getting clogged up. 
We put patients on commercial soap scrubs. Some patients use baby shampoo. I'm not a big fan of the baby shampoo. There's better um, commercial uh, lid soap scrubs. Uh, there's ones that have some active ingredient of tea tree oil because I'll show you a picture. Mites can get into the lids as well and cause that in, uh, cause a chronic blepharitis. Um, there's something called Blefex. It's a mechanical a blepharoexfoliation. You see it in that picture. It's almost like a toothbrush, but it doesn't have bristles, like a mechanical one. We do this in the clinic for patients. This is not an at-home treatment. And we cleanse, um, we debris to do a really good debridement of the lid margin. And um, it kind of gets you boosted in the right direction so that you have one good deep clean. Yes? It's irritating and it has a lot of ingredients that wouldn't are not necessarily great, the, the, the preservatives in that. So it's not a favorite of mine. So There's a product now called Sterilid. Yeah. Does that kind of fall into this category? Yeah, Sterilids are great. So that's one of the, you know, I have a list I give patients. Again, like artificial tears, I usually tell patients get the one that you like the best, that works the best. So Sterilid is one of them. OcuSoft is another. Oasis makes one. Blink makes one. I mean, you can, you can find a ton of these over the counter. Yes? The Blefex, the, the Blefex, um, for patients who have pretty significant blepharitis, I might recommend we do that in the clinic once a year or once every six months, depending on the severity of their lid margin. Um, gunk that builds up. So if you can't get it yourself at home really well, and I'm seeing this layer of debris and uh, and I'll show you some pictures, then, then that really works well as an in-office procedure that we do for, for patients. It's not, I think they charge $200 for a treatment, so it's not that expensive. And the reason all of these are, they all, they're all disposable units, and, and so that's why there's the extra charge and the insurance doesn't cover these kind of in-office procedures. So let me jump to, well, importance of treating lid margin disease. We sort of talked about that a little bit. There's a lot of these devices now. So you're gonna hear when you go in, if somebody tells you you've got lid margin disease. Lipiflow has been out for a while, so you may have heard of Lipiflow. Lipiflow is a 12 minute procedure. It's, it's this picture here on the bottom where we uh, sort of hook up the lids. It's, it's painless and actually feels really good. And it's a 12 minute heat is applied from under the eyelid. So it's right over those oil glands. It doesn't go through the skin and muscle, but it's right over those oil glands. And then there's a 12 minute massage sequence to kind of clean out those oil glands. It's a very comfortable way of cleaning out the oil glands. Now there's also different other ones. For example, there's the eye care system where we put these little um, applicators on the lids, heat is applied for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we go in with one of those clamps that you saw in that video, and we squeeze out those glands and, and get that toothpaste out of the glands. Yeah, but it works really well, and, and you know, some patients need that because they have a lot. Ilux, Mybaflow, these are all versions of the same thing. Heat and squeeze, heat and squeeze, okay? And there, none of them are covered by the insurance. If they were, I'd be treating every single person in this room, and myself too, and all my patients. Um, but they're, they work really well. Lipiflow has been out the longest and we have the most data on that. Um, so we know with one treatment of Lipiflow, things like tear breakup time, ocular surface staining, uh, and symptoms have shown improvement and that has lasted to about a year. So a lot of patients tell me, okay, I, I'm gonna do, I'll do one of these treatments and how long does that last? I usually tell patients one to two years. The studies have shown that the benefit seems to last about a year. Now, if you're very, very severe, I've had patients that come in earlier and say, I want another treatment sooner than that. And there's no danger to that. Um, but usually once a year is sufficient. Some patients who are doing really well with the warm compresses, they say that one treatment did me well and I'm out 18 months. I say, well, let's wait. Let's wait until you start having symptoms again and then maybe we'll do another treatment. So, um, you know, one to two years. Here's me getting my first lip of flow treatment mm -hmm. and uh, it feels very, I have really bad dry eye, yeah. How much does that cost? It, it, it costs $500 per eye which is actually a lot better. It used to cost 750 per eye for years and years, 
And then Johnson & Johnson, which acquired this um, technology, they dropped the cost of their applicators and they actually dropped the cost of their machine. So, um, so they were able to transfer that um, savings to patients. So the price has dropped so from what it used to be. Insurance. It's not covered by any insurance. But it's sometimes I think you know it, it's worth it because we pay a lot of money on the tears and everything else. And the oil glands really are are the key part. This is the other thing I found: the earlier I treat patients and the severity of their disease, the better they do. So if I see a patient and all their oil glands have atrophied already, well, I'm not going to. You're not going to get much benefit from this. So the more severe patients get the least benefit. But the patients who are starting to have early disease and we're starting to see it, they do really well because we're able to catch it early and get them back to sort of physiologic levels in terms of their oil productions and such. This is what the applicator looks like. It's super safe. It's a contact lens that goes on the eye. There's really no um, danger to it at all. Intense pulse light is another therapy. We don't have this at UC Irvine. It's um, dermatologists use it for rosacea of the skin. It's off-label for use for dry eyes, but a lot of ophthalmology colleagues of mine have IPL and have used it. It applies heat. It's supposed to coagulate those little blood vessels, the inflamed blood vessels that are going to the lid margin. And uh, after an IPL treatment, the, the doctor then does that squeeze of the lids, try to ex express the oils again, the secretions. Um, it works for certain skin types better than others. Um, and you know, for some patients who I feel would benefit from this, I actually refer them to a colleague in, in the area that does have IPL. Not that many places will have IPL available. What about omega-3 fatty acids? So these are like fish oils that we can take. Lots of controversy recently, um, and I'll tell you sort of what the bottom line is. There's tons of studies, randomized clinical control trials in the literature that show that there's a benefit to taking omega-3 fatty acid supplementation for symptoms and signs of dry eye disease. There's one study that shows, well, maybe it's equivalent to taking olive oil. And because of that one study, there was a lot of controversy and some doctors said, well, should we be prescribing it or not? And, and after a lot of deliberation and sort of discussion and my personal research and talking to a lot of colleagues, we still think that there's a big benefit to using. Um, Reesterified omega-3 fatty acids are better than your run-of-the-mill Costco fish oil. So Reesterified um, has better bioabsorption, and there's a couple of brands, I have no financial interest in them, that make the Reesterified omega-3 fatty acids. So I think those are better than the run-of-the-mill Costco fish oils that you get, and they, they smell less fishy. Um, okay, well, one brand is called PRN Omega Health. PRN Omega Health. Um, and I think Oasis makes one. Nordic, N O R D I C, or K, is another brand. So if you look, look up any of these, um, you should be able to find them. Great question. So I always tell patients start with the lowest. You know, you can do up to like 3,000. But start low and make sure that you can tolerate before you build up. What's the side effect? Stomach? Yeah, I mean, if you get a little stomach irritation, I usually say take it on a full stomach. Um, PRN Omega Health, you know, the, the pills for me are really irritating because they're big. PRN Omega uh, Health makes it in a um, liquid, so you can just take a teaspoon a day. I like that one. It's $75 on Amazon. Is it really? Mm -hmm. You can go to their website directly too, I think. Might be less. I'm not sure. You can. It's you can. Is yeah. it similar? It's yeah. It's the same. Yeah. So we're spending a lot of out of pocket money for. I mean, it's a huge dry eyes. It's such a huge industry now. Let's talk about mites. Really gross. Yeah, but sometimes <laughs> patients who have chronic blepharitis and it's not going away, it's mites. It's more common than we think. They get in there, they make a little nest around the hair follicle, lash follicle. And the only way to get rid of them is long-term lid scrubs with the active ingredient of tea tree oil, tea tree oil. You can't use tea tree oil directly on the lids. It, it will burn. Um, so don't do that. Uh, there's, um, there's one brand called Clearadex. 
but but um, Steri Lid I think also has one. There a lot of these uh, lid scrubs are coming out with with ones that have tea tree oil in them, and you just have to do it chronically, months months and months of treatment to get these. Um, to diminish significantly enough to get you back to sort of a healthy lid margin. So twice a day lid scrubs for these. Blefex treatment works well too because it gives you one good debridement um, and sort of cleanses the lids once really well and then you, you can start the tea tree oil. There's a face wash at Costco that has tea tree oil in it. I tell patients, you know, just get that and wash your face with that too. Um, it can't hurt, yeah. And it's, it's Trader Joe's, so it's like three bucks or something. Yes? What percentage of your patients that have dry eye also have mites? That's a really good question. Um, or what percent of patients that have blepharitis have mites? Um, it's probably more than we diagnose. Because you can't really diagnose it 100% until you pluck a lash and go to a microscope and look under it and you sometimes see them moving and wiggling. <laughs> yeah, but, but you can also see clinically when I look if there's these little um, kind of oily scales and collarettes around the lash margin, that's the nest. So usually you can diagnose it this way. I would say it's more common than we think. So like 20% of blepharitis patients probably have some amount of mites, some more than others. That's Clearidex. Clearidex has a really high concentration of the active ingredient of tea tree oil. How do you scrub your lid? It's really hard. I used to tell patients how to do it all the time, and then I went home and tried to do it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. So, scrubbing your lids at home. So, you know, I, I, I usually say try to, the lower lids are easier because you can pull down your lid and sort of clean the lid margin below. The upper lids are hard to do. Well, the, these are pads that have the soap in them. So you can actually take the pad, you can even cut it in half so you could, you know, save a little bit of money that way and use, you know, use a half for each eye. Um, and then you look down to do the upper lids. You kind of look down, pull it up, and try to get to the lash margin. Yeah, but if there's, you know, I'm, I'm starting to recommend Blefex more and more in patients who have a lot of gunk to at least get you boosted in the right direction if, if I feel there's something like this going on. Serum drops, um, these are drops we make out of um, your own blood. This is one of the best things in dry eye disease. I mean, one of the most successful treatments. Um, we think it's because of the growth factors that help sort of heal the chronic micro erosions on the cornea. And um, it's a little bit of a process, but it's gotten easier. There's a company now that we use that comes to the patient's house and they do the blood draw the right then and there. They ship it back to their national center. They spin it down. They put the serum into a bunch of little vials and they send you a, a six month supply or what they think is a six month supply and, and you freeze it and it's good in the freezer for at least that long. And you take one um, you know, while at a time, it, you refrigerate it, you use it up all week and then you toss it, take the next one out. Um, I usually tell patients start aggressively, so I start patients every couple of hours if they're very severe, but then we try to get them to a, um, maybe a twice or three times a day uh, maintenance dose over time. Some patients only need one or two rounds and then we can get them back to their artificial tears. So it really depends on the severity of the ocular surface when I see patients in terms of what I, what I recommend or how frequently to use it. Not covered by the insurance either. So this company charges about $660 for their six month supply. And that includes the, um, you know, the lab, the blood draw, and all of that, their processing fee and everything. What is the, what is the, the, the rationale behind, I mean, your eyes are part of your health. Yeah, what is so, the behind good question. So the question is, what it, why, why aren't some of these things covered? And a lot of it has to do with insurances don't want to cover anything. So if there's no... Um, strong evidence. There's no company that uh, will support a randomized clinical control trial on serum because there's no company to, to fund such a trial. So there's no research. This is not covered. That's 330 Yeah, month. right. You're right. Even drug coverage is not great. Yeah, that's, a, that's a larger, wide-scale 
system problem that we have. So there's coupons. Yeah, I mean, I try to do the best I can to find what gets covered by the patient's insurance and trade. That, that, honestly, I'm more of my decisions are based on that than what I really think we need to do, unfortunately. But there's more and more options coming out, which is nice because I have a little bit more variability. Some insurance covers Restasis, some will cover Zydra, some covers. So we, we play around and try to find something that works. But serum is, is not covered by anything. So let's, let's sort of um, come to, you know, a lot of patients ask me about cataract surgery and dry eye disease. Will cataract surgery make my dry eyes worse? Yes, temporarily. And uh, so I always tell patients, let's optimize you before we go into surgery as much as possible. You're gonna still need dry eye treatments after surgery. And as a matter of fact, in the early post-operative period, I say use more of either your serum or your preservative-free artificial tears. Uh, we really wanna get aggressive with dry eye treatment perioperatively before and right after surgery. But it, if you do that and you're aggressive, then you do fine. And then, then the cataract surgery is fine. So it's, it's not, it's only the patients that really have trouble are, are the ones where, uh, you know, you never were told you had dry eye disease and dry eyes, you know, became evident after cataract surgery because it pushed, pushed patients over the threshold and, and they feel that cataract surgery caused the dry eyes. But in fact, they may have had dry eye disease that wasn't really addressed well before. So symptoms and signs don't always correlate. We talked about that. Um, some patients have severe dry eyes and they don't feel anything. Some patients have terrible disease, but when I look at them, I'm, or terrible symptoms, and when I look at their eyes, I'm like, well, I don't see so much, but, but the symptoms are real. So they, they don't correlate symptoms and signs. Um, untreated dry eye disease prior to cataract surgery will definitely result in poor optical outcomes and patient dissatisfaction. I've seen this across the board. I get referrals into me all the time unhappy patients who had their cataract surgery done and they think something went wrong with the cataract surgery. The cataract surgery went fine. It was actually the dry eye disease that got worse or they had dry eye disease, it never was addressed and, and it's, it's the ocular surface that's the problem. So we wanna treat inflammation and lid margin really concomitantly before um, you know, signing up patients for dry eye disease. And so my conclusions are basically chronic dry eyes usually need a cocktail, multiple interventions, and depending on the severity of the patient, it's variable. Just because it worked for my friend, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for me and vice versa. Um, you know, for patients who are going through cataract surgery, the severity of their dry eye disease may um, hinder me from choosing certain types of lenses. Um, and that's sort of a different discussion altogether. But, and dry eye research is hot. There's a lot of things in the pipeline, so we're excited. It's an exciting sort of uh, time to be in dry eye disease for me as a physician, because I have more tools at my disposal. Again, 20 years ago, punctal plugs, that was about it, and artificial tears, that was about it. Now there's a lot more. So, um, What's IOL? IOL, sorry, is intraocular lens for cataract surgery. Sorry about that. This was actually a lecture for that I gave to colleagues. So. Um, so that, that sort of sums up my slides, but I'm, I'm happy to sort of open it up for questions. So screen time is huge. We're seeing, again, a rise of um, dry eye disease in young patients, um, children and, um, uh, you know, students, undergraduate, medical students, patients who are on the screen all the time for hours and hours. The blink rate goes down. And there is some evidence that shows that blue light may impact also the epithelial cells of the cornea. So there's a lot of research looking at blue light and its impacts as well. So blue screen filters, taking breaks when you're on the screen, using your artificial tears every 15, 20 minutes when you're on the screen, very important. Yeah, so there's some companies looking at incorporating blue light filters into the screen. That's sort of pipeline still. What I do on my phone, at least, is I turn on the blue light. There's like a filter on this, or nighttime, <coughs> at least at night. But it's, you know, I think just being, having my eyes open and staring at a screen is, is the bigger, bigger culprit.
great question. Um, here they will. <laughs> um, but yes, most physicians will. Um, uh, you know, one of the big, the biggest screening is is we wait for patients to tell us, and um, we need to get more proactive as an ophthalmic community and ask patients, are you having these symptoms, fluctuating vision? needing to use a lot of artificial tears, burning, you know, all of that. If those aren't, you know, readily uh, given to the doctor, then we look at ocular surface, how the tear film looks, is there staining. So depending on who you see, um, you'll get some degree of screening. Don't pick up. Sometimes, not always. For dry eyes? Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's nothing that's been shown that that would really impact or improve dry eyes. Um, moisture goggle glasses do. So there's some patients that, you know, there's these glasses that kind of wrap all the way around to create sort of a moisture chamber um, for patients who are really sensitive to even just environmental winds and just having their eye open. Um, and so there are companies that make moisture chamber goggles that help. Yeah, so the gels and ointments over the counter. The the, the, there's Gentile gel. Some patients prefer gel, some patients prefer ointment. I like Gentile gel personally, but it does blur your vision, but you're asleep. And that seems to help with the morning, that morning sensation a little bit, yes. Um, so that's a great question. How do they get so gunky and, and so thick? Di I think some of it has to do with our, you know, the diet. Um, oh, I think we think fish oils help with keeping the quality of those oils healthier. Um, but if you do nothing and sort of go back to your regular lifestyle, they will re-clog up again over time. It, it can take maybe a, a year sometimes. So for example, with Lipiflow, I'll repeat it in a year. It, it expresses the trapped thickened oils and, and fats. So they, they, the oils tend to flow better after that, after one of those treatments. Um, no. <laughs> With the water, you don't have the, the right balance. No, I've, I've heard this before. Um, you don't have the right balance of oils. You're, you can give yourself dishpan eyes because you're actually washing out the oils in your tear film. So um, try the oil-based artificial tears. There's some nice ones like Retain MGD is a good oil-based artificial tear. Oasis makes one with high hyaluronic acid. I have no financial interest in these companies that I'm throwing out there, by the way. Um, but that one has a high hyaluronic acid, which, which coats the ocular surface really well too. There's been studies that show flaxseed oil, for example, can be very beneficial for dry eyes as well, signs and symptoms. Does it work as well? I don't think I, I, I know of any head-to-head -head studies. But if you can't take fish oil, I have patients who are vegans or vegetarians who don't want to take fish oils, then that's reasonable. Flaxseed oil also helps. It does have the same omega-3 and it's anti-inflammatory in, in, in a similar way. So the, the question would be, what, what, why is there anemia in the first place? So no, there's no direct correlation, but if there's an autoimmune issue going on that's creating the anemia, then yes, you can also get dry eye disease. Yeah, great question. Right. So, does dry eye disease cause other um, ocular or, or other ophthalmic conditions? So, dry eye disease cannot cause macular degeneration, glaucoma, or cataract. Um, pterygium is an ocular surface growth that's usually from ultraviolet. It's, it's not caused by dry eye disease, but sometimes it can irritate the surface and the symptoms overlap. And so, if you have a pterygium and you have dry eye disease, you kind of have double the amount of ocular surface irritation going on. So they can kind of compound each other because they're both on the surface. But dry disease doesn't cause any diseases within the eye.
Saline, again, saline is more water, so the balance between the water and oil is a little bit different. Um, it's probably not harmful, but if you're finding that you're using saline all the time, then, um, then it's not enough. Then you're probably washing out a lot of your oils. But it's not harmful if you use it for a little while. Yeah, so for contact lens wear, that's a good question. Contact lens wears patients are dry and they don't know it necessarily because they they have a contact lens blocking the pain or the nerves, almost like a Band-Aid. Um, so artificial, a lot of contact lens wears have chronic inflammation, low grade. And so something like Restasis or Zydra, before you put your contact lens on in the morning and after you take them out, seems to work really well for that group of patients, especially because they're young and they don't want to be putting a drop in all day. No, um, that's a great question. Is it bad to put an eye mask over the salve? So I actually have, I, I give this talk to the dry eye. There's a dry eye support group in Orange County. And they're fantastic. They're, they're not like, they're, it's just like this. Just meetings like this that happen a few times a year. They're fantastic. And you know, one thing I heard from one of um, the members there is uh, she puts oil or the gentil or the gel in and then takes a little saran wrap and sort of, <laughs> you're not doing that. But it creates a little moisture chamber and then she puts an eye mask over the whole thing and it keeps it in place. I absolutely think so. So yeah, the, the healthier the diet. So it's all about the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s, with omega-3s being more um, anti-inflammatory, omega-6s are more pro-inflammatory. A healthy ratio is, is 4 to 1 on omega-6 to omega-3s. The American diet is like 16 to 1 where we get a lot more pro-inflammatory omega-6s in our diets than we get omega-3s. I actually, um, somewhere in my computer there's a slide on that. But um, So yes, you can change the balance of the oils you're getting in through the diet and, and, and get that balance. It's hard to do. Well, it's about the balance. So, no, actually, a normal diet would be like a four to one omega six to omega three, but the American diet is more like a sixteen to one balance, yeah, ratio. So, Preservision, Occupy, those are a few that you mentioned. Those are. Um, vitamins specifically for macular degeneration. And those are, um, that's a group of vitamins, higher dose of zinc, uh, lutein, things like that, that have been shown in um, retinal disease and macular degeneration to slow down the advance of macular degeneration. So our retina specialists will recommend those for patients with um, certain types of macular degeneration. Interestingly, the one study that said, well, omega-3s are equivalent to olive oil, they used olive oil as in their placebo group. And then the question was, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe olive oil is, is very good. I think it is. It does increase permeability of um, the cell walls. And, and so uh, I think it's, it's potentially beneficial as well. There's no direct study. So I, I like to make sure when I'm speaking, I know there's some evidence based about what I'm saying. So there's, there's no strong evidence base, but you know, I, my feeling is that it probably has some benefit. You're asking me about my current research work, so I'm looking into that currently because there's nothing really that's shown that, but it's a huge player, I think. The, the worst dry eye disease patients sometimes I see are, are, 
are, are women that have worn a lot of makeup and, and probably created some inflammation chronically from the different products around their lid margin and caused oil gland dysfunction or worsened it. So I think so, yes. Itching usually implies allergies. Yeah, and so, so if you're having a lot of itching, there's some kind of allergic component as well to the dry eye disease, and often they go together. So we've got to look for environmental things that might be triggering the allergy.